Okay, good morning. Uh, we probably uh, now find ourselves on the analysis side. Uh, but you won't get away from my concern with uh, representation, as it'll keep, it, it keeps bubbling up. Uh, and uh, I'll try to suppress it and keep keep focus, but it's it's not it's not it's not so uh, so easy to do. Um, the uh, the topics from now on uh, will be uh, spatial autocorrelation. So this morning, spatial autocorrelation. This afternoon, uh, no streaming and uh, project surgery. So we can uh, talk f uh, ab 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 about your projects, get some some feedback. Then uh, go on to tomorrow, which will be uh, spatial regression in particular settings. Um, the applications would probably most mostly be social science, uh, but many of the approaches also uh, are ecologically relevant. Um, but not necessarily going to the extent of uh, of looking, say, at at, at um, species distribution models, which are a, a different uh, a different kind of approach, and not necessarily going towards models which are typically used in uh, in uh, epidemiology. Uh, one of the features of the models used in in ecology uh, are that, especially for for uh, presence absence data, uh, obviously the response is is binary, so either present or or not. Uh, in epidem epidemiological models, the response is typically count, so the number of incidences. And those are some of the, the things which I'll, I'll try to mention in passing. Uh, but the, the weight of the literature in the social sciences is to try to treat the response as continuous. Now, whether this is relevant or a good idea or not is something which, which defeats me. Uh, it defeats me because say, say that you're looking at um, uh, labor market work and say that you're looking at unemployment. Now, the incidence of unemployment is also a count aggregated over some aerial unit. And why one should then model the rate directly rather than modeling the rate through a, a Poisson regression, which is what an epidemiologist would do simply out of the box. They'd say, OK, it's count data. We do count data. Poisson log link. And offset by the by the uh, population at risk uh, in modelling, say uh, unemployment rates or other phenomena of the same kind, poverty rates, um, whatever. Social scientists tend to feel constricted to use uh, to use a rate, a continuous rate, which also then means that they can't handle shrinkage to deal with the. Um, blown up rates which occur when the population at risk is is small and I, I haven't seen any review articles discussing this so that it appears that there are relatively watertight boundaries between different disciplines in the way that they handle spatial regression then on friday i'll rush through uh, uh, interpolation geostatistics and point processes and try and spend about an hour on on on, on each of them uh, I may run out of time, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Uh, and the purpose of those would be that that if at some stage in in your uh, future careers you're going to have to inform other people about it, then it may be useful to have at least heard some of the some of the uh, some of the um, um, background. So. Uh, for some of the the sessions to tomorrow and on Friday, I haven't even bothered to try to set up about how much time I want to spend on things. As you've seen so far, I'm flexible about this. Uh, and this 
this talk is uh, based relatively uh, verbatim on a, uh, a workshop that Edsa Pepsmer and I gave in Toulouse at USAR in July this, this, this year, where um, Edsa was talking about data structures and representation, and uh, I was challenged to talk about uh, spatial autocorrelation, spatial regression. So first, the, the spatial autocorrelation bit. Um, positionality. Uh, social scientists do positionality, so do that. Uh, I first encountered um, spatial autocorrelation at Cambridge in 1970. Uh, undergraduates at Cambridge are taught uh, in small groups, two, three, uh, by uh, either supervisors in, in colleges, uh, supervisors in the department, and very often by research students. And I, I was taught during 71 and early 72 by, by two research students, uh, Neil Wrigley, who's gone on to work on, 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 on uh, particularly on retail, uh, and by Leslie Heppel. And Leslie Heppel was writing a review paper about the issue of spatial autocorrelation. Now, as I mentioned on, on Monday when we were talking about what possible topics to do, spatial autocorrelation is, uh, is something which can be found. You can find it in spatial data uh, because the, uh, because the uh, data that you have to hand will not necessarily constitute a set of um, independent observations. And it's fairly obvious that if you have a, uh, a map and you chunk it up into bits, either with administrative boundaries or with uh, raster cells, the entities which you're observing are not the, for want of a better term, naturally occurring entities, they're entities which we are imposing on them. And, and as I mentioned on, on, uh, on, uh, on Monday, one of the, the support issues is, say that you're, you're dealing with social science data, but the actual movements of people in space are determined by a labor market. But very typically, the labor market will be, uh, will be underbounded by a, one set of administrative units, but if you step up to the next level of administrative units, they will overbound the labor market and include other small independent labor market components within them. So that the, the problem uh, of entitation is one which engenders or can engender uh, spatial autocorrelation. So that knowing what units one's observing makes a difference. That's in the case in particular with aggregated data. However, in many other cases, one can, on the basis of um, natural science, infer that uh, the variable of interest constitutes a continuous surface. So that you could say, well, we can't observe meteorological variables everywhere, but we know that they could be observed everywhere. Uh, air temperature at two meters above the ground could be observed in principle everywhere. It's a bit difficult on the ocean because your boat's going up and down, but, but in principle you could observe it anywhere. You could observe uh, uh, air moisture uh, in water bodies. You could observe salinity. You could observe water color at specific depths. And in a water body, given that it's deep enough, you could observe the, 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 the salinity at 100 meters depth everywhere. So you could treat that as uh, that you're sampling from a surface. In another kind of spatial data, point patterns, what you're observing are simply the locations where a particular class of, of phenomena are observed. And once again, the suspicion is that Probably, probably there's, there's something going on. There's something associating these one with another. In, in, in social science terms, one might speak about uh, 
competition as generating negative autocorrelations of the, the, the given phenomena will, will, if you like, push values apart, or if competition can also generate similar values. You don't want to be selling, uh, or at the time when, uh, when um, um, fuel prices were uh, set by filling stations or uh, gas stations, uh, independently, you didn't want to have a price which was obviously higher than your proximate neighbour whose big sign could be seen by motorists. Motorists could compare the prices directly and you wouldn't want, so that you, there would be some, some interaction going on there. Which is not an, it, it's not a, it's not a, that's not an aggregation issue, it's not an entitation issue, it's at micro level, uh, micro level behaviour. Uh, one can also observe uh, observe um, similar kinds of behaviour um, between local authorities. That if local authorities have uh, have the have the the, the 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 freedom to set particular regulations or set particular taxes, then they may also exhibit behaviour where they they don't want to differ too much from a proximate neighbour. So that if your neighbouring local authority sets uh, refuse collection charges down. You probably don't want to be left with price or the charges to, to to inhabitants which are twenty thirty percent higher than the proximate neighbour, unless you're offering something else in in return. The bundle of of services from living in one place is obviously better, even though you're paying more for refuse collection. So so you can get. Uh, um, um, in, I, I would prefer to use the, the, the term tactical behaviour, but you also get strategic behaviour between, uh, between economic uh, actors. So spatial autocorrelation is, is, is a very multifaceted um, um, concept with very, very uncertain, um, given the entitation problem, um, diagnosis the, 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 to say why it, you, you you can measure it and observe it given the entities you have, but saying why it got there is not so easy. Okay. So uh, the first step would then be to say that the entry point for quite a lot of this was in the period something was known about the possibility that uh, spatial autocorrelation uh, affected inference uh, 100 years ago. So that there was a consciousness that this might occur. Even uh, before that, there was a question at a presentation at which uh, uh, um, Galton was present, where uh, a, 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 a field anthropologist had been in the colonies and had found what was seen to be a significant difference between cultural practices in 20 villages and cultural practices in other 20 villages. And Galton asked, well, how many observations have you actually made? Have you observed simply two cultures? And then you could just have looked at two villages which were different, but you say that you've observed 20 like this, 20 like that. So how many observations have you actually got as effective degrees of freedom? Why do you why do you think that observing the same thing lots of times gives your argument argument more strength? And that argument then then sort of iterates went round a bit. There's a paper by by a student by Gossett uh, uh, talking about the same thing and saying, well, we do have to be very careful with observations in time and probably space, because we don't, it, it's not the case that if we were conducting a, a, an experiment where the observations were being generated independently one of another, then we know that each observation carries its full weight into our uh, analysis. But if we're observing something which is actually the same thing, but we're observing it multiple times, 
sort of all bets are off. Is that you get a problem that the the is you, you can calculate the mean, which is just a, a measure. You can calculate the standard deviation of your observations. That's just a measure. But if you want to calculate the standard error of the mean, then the number of effective observations cuts in, and with positive autocorrelation, that is that you can predict one observation from another mutually, then you can't do that. The same thing would apply with the time series. If, if you can predict y at t from y at t minus 1 and y at t minus 2, so you've got a linear trend, then actually how many observations, what, how many values do you need to set a linear trend? You need two, one for the intercept, one for the slope. And you could have 100 observations, but you still, you've only really got two. Well, two plus, plus an unknown a random bit. So how many observations have you actually got? Uh, there were then comments made about field trials. Uh, you'll be aware that statisticians working in the 20s and 30s were, were heavily engaged on field trials. Uh, for, uh, say, yields of, of grain, things like this. And then they started wondering, well, we've laid out the plots across our field here with the different varieties. And we know, well, maybe we've even randomized the varieties across the plots, and we know that there's some variation in the, in the, uh, soil, uh, the, the soil chemistry across the plots. We can control uh, water supply, use irrigation, so we can control some things, do some experiments. But maybe the neighboring plots influence in each other in ways that we are not able to control in experimental terms. By random, randomizing which treatment goes to which plot, you can do something. But they were aware of the problem. They were aware that something like this might be going on. And then after the, uh, after the Second World War, uh, work by uh, Geary and Moran, who are both Irish uh, statisticians, uh, started to, to focus in on some of the aspects for what are known as lattice data, as data in, uh, in aerial aggregates. They started looking, looking at this, initially at uh, categorical variables and then subsequently in, in continuous, continuous variables. At much the same time, attention was being drawn to point pattern analysis and the so whether things cluster or not. Um, you typically divided an area up into quadrats, and then you'd see that three or four of the quadrats would have enhanced counts of phenomena, which is something of the same, that you're seeing a uh, uh, perhaps unexpected concentration of the phenomena, which are, which are, they're choosing their own, like um, uh, plants, um, they're choosing their own locations, and they appear to be clustered. Subsequently, we've realized that the clustering which is observed there, and the same applies in general to spatial autocorrelation, may actually be being driven by something, so that plants may cluster not because they need to be close to each other to thrive, but they may cluster because where they're clustered, there is an abundance of a particular resource background variable, which we may not have measured, but which is actually driving the clustering. And quite a lot of spatial autocorrelation is model misspecification of that kind. Is that what's happening is that we're observing apparent spatial autocorrelation, which may even not be being driven by, uh, by, by, by the entitation problem, but it's being driven by the fact that we have a missing, uh, missing background variable or that we're including a background variable or driver uh, in the wrong functional form. Uh, in uh, so one of the cases in which spatial autocorrelation occurs abundantly is where, uh, say, say, that, say that you have uh, a, a plant uh, abundance map. And so, say you're looking at, at Germany. So the north of Germany is rainy and cool and cloudy. The south of Germany is in the mountains. And 
this species really likes the middle of Germany because it has quite warm summers, not too much rain, but it's not too cold in the winter. And that's where it really likes things. But if you, but if you fit a, uh, a, um, a temperature covariate in the south before you get to the mountains, but where it's a bit dry and it's a bit too hot in the summer, there aren't very many of these plants because they don't like that. And they don't like the cloudy, rainy north because it's a bit cold and wet. They like what's just right in the middle. But if you put a linear fit to that, then obviously as temperature rises moving from the north of Germany to the middle of Germany, you get a fairly good fit because you get an increasing incidence of the, the variable of interest. As temperature, it was a average annual temperature or average temperature in July rises. But as you go further south, average temperature continues to rise, but the incidence of the, of the species falls. Which means that the residuals from that regression are going to show strong spatial autocorrelation, which is engendered almost exclusively because of the fact that you're not using the correct functional form, which would be curvilinear, which would be to say that this plant, yeah, there's a linear relationship. It likes it when it's warmer than really cold. But when it gets to temperature squared or some curvilinear relationship, it doesn't like the temperature going up too much so that you get a negative coefficient on, on, the, on the square of temperature. So those kinds of things that you can get apparent spatial autocorrelation cutting in because you've got missing uh, background variables, because you've got, because you've got uh, inappropriate functional form in the relationship, uh, and, and in addition to the entitation problems and, 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 uh, and the, the wrong footprint in your entities with regard to the, the underlying processes. That's just space. Time has its own problems. Obviously, time has uh, um, directed so time is a directed graph. Uh, and then obviously spatiotemporal data uh, combines these two uh, areas in which uh, autocorrelation, that's the lack of independence between observations, uh, breaks the, the fundamental rules of independence of observations. Social networks are the same. So that looking at network problems, then you're in exactly the same, the, the, the same problem. Uh, one of the further issues which, uh, which is now, um, I would really like to say that it's spooking big data and people doing data science, but it isn't because they don't get spooked. They should, but uh, spooking is when a horse says, no, 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 I don't want to jump over that, uh, which is with quite a lot of social science data, we don't have a sample from a known population. If we're doing experimental work, then we can set up the, the sort of a theoretical population of all of the, the, the ways we could set up the experiment, and we can sample from that. We can take some of them. Or we can, we, we can take all of the, the, the variants which, which are available. But we can design the data collection. Uh, in very many situations in social sciences, it's difficult to design data collection. In uh, ecology, it can be difficult to design data collection because some of the data you can you can you for some of the data you can control data collection, for uh, other data then you're you're a, a taker so you're taking remote sensing data which maybe the instruments were designed for some general purpose but but not necessarily so that that doing the work that you do like. Uh, for instance, the use by the, the Brazilian analysts of satellite data to find illegal logging. Uh, you're having to work with data, which was in this case the the instruments, the standard instruments on 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 the platforms, uh, and you're having to to understand the way in which the data the the data has been generated. But very often in social sciences and also in epidemiology. Uh, in some cases in epidemiology, studies can be designed from the ground up and you know what you're measuring. But in cases where you need to intervene in an ongoing epidemic, uh, 
then there's no way that you could have designed the data collection because the, the, the number of incidences are simply what are coming in. And you also know that the, the, there's error present in those simply because of, of, uh, of um, ill people not reporting to the health authorities, as I mentioned with Olinda yesterday, because the, they didn't feel that they were eligible to, to receive help because they, were, they, they, they weren't legal inhabitants. So that the epidemiologists have to have eyes in the back of their heads to, 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 to sort of see whether what they're picking up is actually the signal or whether it's simply more, more noise. Uh, I've mentioned entitation already. One of the things which is, is, is somewhat painful is that uh, designing spatial samples used to be so that if you look at, at, at uh, Brian Ripley's uh, book on spatial statistics from 1981 and his later book uh, from uh, 1988 on, on uh, inference, or Savan uh, uh, Muller's book on spatial sampling, they're not taught really now. So you sort of, uh, when, when Edsa goes to talk to Uber or Airbnb. So I now have an have ongoing thread with someone trying to analyze Airbnb data. Do you know how, how much do you know about the sampling? How, how do you know? Do you assume that everything is recorded? as is? Do you assume that it's as it should be? You'd be aware that Uber is likely to lose its license in London again because the drivers swap identities. Let's say that there's one driver who has a cousin whose car is closer so that they swap identities. So do you, do you actually believe the data which are coming out of the systems or... or Never mind. Uh, but but it, the fact that there's lots of data doesn't make sampling problems easy, easier. And the fact that nobody teaches spatial sampling, or it's taught very little, either n not, not to ecologists, not to statisticians, not, certainly not to geographers, or the social scientists, the, or, or phys not physical geography. Uh, it doesn't make, doesn't make things, th th thing, 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 things easier. There is a, a, a significant literature which is just beginning to appear about uh, sampling issues related to machine learning. So that say we're doing uh, pattern recognition and uh, classification, which is all machine, machine learning is just pattern recognition. So it's logistic regression of some kind, or pattern recognition. Uh, Ripley, 1996. If you want to know about machine learning, Ripley 1996 pattern recognition will tell you essentially everything you need to know. It won't tell you what the current buzzword is, but it, it tells you what you need to know. But there is, there's, there's work going on by, uh, by physical geographers and ecologists on uh, using machine learning with spatial data. And what they've found very clearly is that if you try to do the... Uh, um, uh, uh, training set, validation set, test set, then you have to be extremely careful in the choice of the validation set and the test set. So the, the, the reference to Schwartz and others who cite that work is, 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 if machine learning is something you may be obliged to address, then go, go for their work. What they're talking about is, if you take random things, then you break up the the graph of relationships between the, the data entities. So that what you may be much more, what you may find much more, um, uh, much more uh, appropriate is to uh, subdivide the area of interest into an area which we're going to use for training and then a separate area which we're going to use for validation or testing. Because then the, the, the graphs do cross a little so that the, 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 the um, so I'm now trying to work out from your point of view which is east and which is west. 
uh, from your point of view, that's west and that's east. Okay, so the, the, the westernmost neighbor, which was in the training set here, has a neighbor who is the first neighbor on the eastern side of the test set. And there will, there will be some uh, spillover leakage of information between these. You can cut them off altogether and put a boundary around so that you don't get leakage between the two sets of neighbors. So the information from the, as if you just do it to choose the, 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 the test set at random, then you're cutting out parts of the graph of relationships between the spatial entities. And that doesn't make any, any real kind of sense. So, and it also doesn't work, which is what they establish in, in, in their studies. Uh, is that you get uh, you, you get spurious results, you get models which appear to be uh, either well fit or not well fit. They jump all around the place, so, so you don't get models which 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 are reliable. So you you need to think about the the spatial representation in 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 tuning the the models. And when you're tuning the models, you also need to be careful about how you do it. Uh, a specialist note uh, is a paper by. Paolo Ribeiro with, with co-authors, uh, which came out uh, the last year or the year before, which, which I refereed, which is uh, to do with INLA. INLA is the Trondium success, is uh, uh, um, integrated nested Laplacian approximation. And uh, a further iteration on top of that is to insert a, uh, a latent mesh so that you say that the spatial process as observed is as it's observed, but you can map that onto a latent layer of locations which can be less dense where there's little variability in the data set and need to be more dense where there's more action in the data set. Uh, but Paolo Ribeiro has gone further and studied for a number of data sets how the choice of the mesh and the uh, analyst has to cho choose the mesh or choose the parameters for setting up the mesh uh, influences the outcomes and finds that it does. So that space bites anyway. Uh, even, if, even if you're using <laughs> the most modern techniques, you still need to think before you put it into the computer. Uh, and, and you need to think when you see the results and say, ah, I'll try a different approach, try, try, try something else, tweak something. Not to make it better, but to find out how bad the original results were. That's not how you sell data science. Hello, data science. The, the, the finance minister is coming here to talk about data science on, uh, tomorrow. Uh, I'm not invited because I am. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know. Yes, good, good, good. Uh, and I'm busy, we're, we're busy tomorrow. But some of these, some of what I'm trying to do is is the same as as Brian Ripley did in the preface to his his or the first chapter of his his uh, uh, 1988 book on 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 statistical inference from spatial data, which is to say, okay, this is this is a challenging area. It won't get any better, but it needs to be done. So we need to do it with attention and care. You can't just stick stuff into procedures and believe what comes out. We need to think through uh, where did the data come from? How were they aggregated? Could they be been ag aggregated differently? Which other other choices could have been made which might lead us to a, a different, different re re result? This leads us quite closely to, to, to a Bayesian approach. It doesn't have to be Bayesian, but, but, but it leads us to thinking about simulating from, uh, uh, simulating from hypotheses other than the null. Yes? Uh, has anyone addressed different, different spatial structures in the data set, like local structure in some areas and in other parts, in terms of this spatially? There is a literature from the 60s and 70s which was mostly concerned with this, and there is still a certain amount uh, work the, the question was about uh, uh, or the way that I interpreted the question was with re, was with, with, uh, with regard to uh, uh, what in the 60s and 70s and 
possibly 80s, was termed regionalization. What she tried to do was to look at the, uh, the way in which variability occurred across space to try to partition out entities which were more similar one to another. So that you'd, 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 instead of doing clustering, which, is, which would be aspatial, so you do spatial clustering and try and find uh, uh, contiguous areas, areas which touch one another, or uh, observations which are close to one another, which are also similar in variable space. And the, the, there was a fairly large literature. Uh, the, uh, the current extant best practice is a routine called Skater in the uh, uh, in the SPD package. It's implemented by Elias Krainski, uh, based on 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 other Brazilian uh, uh, by uh, Renato Asuncio. Um, I think uh, Gilberto Camara, who's who was the director of the Br Brazilian space program that I referred to, uh, was also involved in the same paper. Uh, so skater is, is the, the skater approach is there's the skater approach is also available in in ArcGIS. Uh, as I know that Renato works with with uh, uh, Mark Janikas to, to to implement that there. So that there is still something of a literature on, if you compare it with the econometrics literature of uh, 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 adding a clustering element. So that you clustering the observations, but that then applies to the residuals rather than going in. And the the, the approach from quantitative geography in the 60s and 70s was to, was to look at ways of finding areas which are similar one to another and proximate. Uh, one way of doing it was a constrained principal components, things like that. So you do principal components on the variable space, but then say we only want to identify clustered or classes within that if they're proximate one to another. Um, if one was being particularly, uh, particularly um, risky, chancy, then you might say that doing that so that you're letting the data tell you which entities should be used for analysis. I, no, I, I'm not going to call it empirical Bayesian because it, that, that would be breaking all the rules. Uh, but um, empirical Bayesian Krieging in Arc, uh, ArcGIS in, in geostatistical, geostatistical Analyst does something which is not quite like that. Uh, it's, it's a little different. Um, uh, and it's also based on, on work by Konstantin Krivoruchko with regard to the Chernobyl uh, disaster. Uh, what just, uh, what uh, empir empirical Bayesian Krieging in geostatistical analysts or empirical Bayesian Krieging does, and the only extant uh, implementation is in, in geostatistical analyst, is to exam dealing with a continuous surface or in a geostatistical setting, is to say that, um, okay, we have uh, sample observations from, from a large area. We know that the values observed might vary, but within sub-areas, does the variance vary? Do we find areas where there is very little variability, which means that we can be fairly confident in making predictions or other areas where there's a lot, it jumps around, jumps around a lot, even taking the covariates into account. So you'd expect, say, observations of temperature to jump around a lot in, in a landscape which is very uh, fragmented. So there are lots of small valleys, and so that on the ridges you get very different circumstances than in, in, in inside the valleys. That would be a background variable. Once you've taken account of that, so on a flat plane, and in, in, in the case of the example which you described very carefully at the Spatial Statistics Conference in, in Spain in July, uh, Constantin described the uh, applied statistics problems which arise when uh, the public authorities ask the analysts whether a village can be re-inhabited. These were villages in Belarus which were evacuated after Chernobyl, there's a very carefully, carefully collected sample data for 
um, remaining radioactive components in the soil. Now, you could just predict what the, the, the level is, but not pay attention to the, how the variability. And in, in, in that case, he said that it was important for the statisticians to focus on the variability in the samples rather than the mean sample level. Because the variability would indicate that maybe actually the, the, the mean prediction for the village is that it's, it's now below the dangerous threshold so that it could be re-inhabited. But because the data from that part of the, the county was very variable, would it not be better for a statistician to say, how likely is it that our prediction or our prediction for this, uh, predictions for this area are uncertain? And if we're uncertain about it, shouldn't we take the health of the inhabitants and put that first and say, actually the value here could exceed the threshold. It's actually quite likely to exceed the threshold because our fit in the predictions is not terribly good. And so that, that in, 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 in papers which they're writing on uh, empirical Bayesian Krieging, what they're focusing on is not so much the ability of, uh, of geostatistical uh, prediction to match the test set by value, but it's to match the variability of the test set. So does the variability that we're predicting match the variability of the test set? And to do that, they have to choose regions with different levels of variability first and then run local models for each of those. So the, 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 it's, it's a good insight. <laughs> it's just that, that in the literature, uh, people have looked the other way. Uh, which means that it's quite difficult to, 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 to encounter situations where uh, complete studies have been done by trying to regionalize first from the data and then work, uh, work, work, work from that. It may be that I'm ill-informed. It may be that, that there is more than I think there is. But I don't, I don't see that. Um, I see lots of cases where people are modeling globally uh, without looking carefully at subsets of the data. Um, so that's a very broad brush uh, introduction to spatial autocorrelation. Um, I met my wife in 1972, so I've been involved with spatial autocorrelation longer than I've known my wife. Okay, so, <laughs> so sorry, <laughs> but but the the. It, it's something which, which hasn't left me. I'm a, I'm a geographer. I'm, I'm not very quantitative. I'm not terribly good at math. Uh, but the, the, this, how do you draw conclusions from data where you can't be completely sure? If you're in a purely experimental situation, you can be much surer. But in, in these kinds of settings where it could be, on the other hand, it could be the other story. So I've also, um, I've also um, worried about, um, okay, no, it, it, in a way, it's, it's really nice that colleagues in the States could get big grants from the Department of Justice because spatial autocorrelation was going to explain the incidence of crime. I mean, I'm not envious of the fact that they've got millions of dollars and lots of doctoral students. And, uh, yeah. But then you're selling spatial autocorrelation as a sort of fix. <laughs> and I don't think it's that either. So the, the, I, I, it is, a, it is a, a, a con conceptual conundrum. Uh, it is present in much of the analyses, uh, many of the analyses we conduct, but it's not immediately obvious where, 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 where to go with this. Okay, so now an example with regard to the uh, uh, induction of a, a spatial process by the analyst. So what I'm going to do here is trot through uh, some examples to show you obvious spatial autocorrelation which isn't there. Okay, so, so it's just, just playing around. Um, 
spatial point processes. So we start with spatial point process and we can develop an intensity function and the intensity function of this, uh, of this uh, uh, completely spatial random, so it's a Poisson point process from the SPATSTAT package is to say that uh, the intensity increases in the distance from the western edge of the, uh, of the, of the study. So we can, we can generate, in this case, uh, uh, we're generating 95, 95 points in a window uh, 0101, so in the unit square, and uh, we can display the density of the, of the uh, inhomogeneous uh, point process that we've, we've created. So we've created a, a point process where the intensity is known to, uh, to be uh, related to the distance from the western edge of, of the box. If we were in a point process uh, setting, one of the tests we could use is, is Ripley's k-hat. And uh, the way in which we're, we're, we're handling this is to, is to uh, sample from the, uh, sample from the, um, the um, hypothesis that the points are completely spatially randomly distributed. If we had not introduced an inhomogeneity, they would be completely spatially randomly distributed, and by uh, 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 undertaking the default number of samples, so that envelope uh, takes samples from the same framework, the boundaries which have been used for, the, for, 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 for our data, so that the unit square, uh, use the uh, uh, um, uh, k-hat, uh, then we get this grey area here, with the red being the theoretical K, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, um, the grey lines, or we've actually got the high and low, which is the 5%, 95% around the envelope. We've got the envelope filled in here for all, all of our, uh, our envelope. And uh, we see that it is very unlikely that our points are... Ran completely randomly distributed. That's wrong. That result is caused by the fact that there was a, 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 an inhomogeneity in the underlying surface. We could model it and say, okay, so that we think that the intensity is related to the distance from the western edge, but we don't know that in advance. So that we could use an inhomogeneous variant of, of uh, k-hat for inhomogeneous data, but it's trying to resolve the inhomogeneity by looking at the data, and the data were, were also relatively random, so it's not finding that either, but it finds that instead of finding the data to be clustered, it finds the data to be uh, pushed apart, so that the data are uh, more regularly spaced, so they're, they're all spaced out with regard to one another, than if this model uh, was was a good fit. This model is not is not a good fit either. Uh, we could uh, go further. We'll say that we're uh, we're creating a, a set of points. They're then a, a, an SFC object uh, with the points, uh, and we are now going to add a. Uh, um, so we're saying that we have now a y, we've got the x variable, which is the distance from the western edge, or the x coordinate distance from the western edge. The y variable, we're going to say, is 100 plus 50 times the distance from the western edge, plus a, a random, a random um, error term. And we can plot the values of the this 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 of the, of this variable. Uh, fairly obviously, the, the this is this is the, the standard color palette for 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 the SP plot methods. So we're seeing the blues and purples and blacks in this area, and as we go further east, then we're seeing more of the of the uh, reds and uh, reds and yellows. We could fit a variogram model, assuming that this is a continuous surface. The, uh, the it's using GSTAT to fit variogram models. And in the first case, uh, we could 
or in one of the cases, we could we could uh, simply say that there's we don't know that there's a trend in the data, so that we're modelling the Y. That's the first one, variogram zero. And we're just saying that Y is modelled by its mean. So we don't know about any, any spatial structure in the data, other than that nearer points are more likely to be similar to one another than points which are further apart. We can then make uh, uh, some predictions and draw that. So we're using a, a, a Lois uh, plot to, 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 um, uh, to express the relationship. Uh, this is the, vari the, vari the empirical variogram, assuming that uh, we don't know about the spatial, uh, the spatial trend in Y. And in this case, we do know about the spatial trend, so that it's fairly flat. A variogram expresses the, or the gamma value is a, a function of the difference between the value of y at one point and the value of y at another point. So you've got observations of gamma which uh, occur for each pair of points. Obviously, the distance between point I and point J and point J and point I are similar. So you've got to take out the, the those differences are going to be uh, symmetric. So you don't need to count both. Uh, and then you bin these by the distance between the pairs of points. So at, th at this point, there's zero distance between the pairs of points. And as you step out here, then we're, we're about halfway across the unit square uh, when we get to here. In this case, we see a clear relationship actually in a variogram if you see a trend line or a line like this then you would tend to think that there's an emitted linear trend because uh, in in a in a in the situation I'll talk about on Friday then a variogram would expect the uh, differences between values which are close to one another to be relatively small and differences between observations which are further apart to reach an, a flat line. So you tend to expect that a, a well-behaved variogram would look like that. But if it does that, it, mean, it usually means that there's an emitted trend or possibly an emitted background variable. If we include the trend, we get a, a variogram which is, is fairly well, uh, well behaved. Uh, the number of the number of pairs in bin, these bins uh, are much smaller than the ones here, so this is better fit than this. The, the, this is better fit than, than than the very beginning here. So we have here a situation where there is there is no autocorrelation. There was no patterning in the points in, in, in this case. There is no patterning based on the point process itself. The patterning is because we have an emitted variable, an emitted linear trend across the area. So the fact that there are few points uh, to the west is because, we, we he, in this case, we've done it by design. But very often, empirically, you don't, you haven't designed it like that, but you see data like this, and you say, well, it seems to be clustering towards the east. And all that's happened is that you've forgotten that there's some, an inhomogeneity driven by a missing variable. So model misspecification. And it's the same thing here. If we put that, if we correctly specify the model by saying, okay, the distance from the western edge makes a difference. Then we get a variogram which is flat and, and says, uh, okay, so there's, there's no spatial story in this at all. Uh, we've got point support for this for this set of data. We can use uh, SPDEP to generate uh, to generate a sphere of influence graph for point support uh, graph based measures of of, of uh, who's a neighbour of whom uh, are quite successful. So here we have a a, a graph of who's a neighbour of whom. Um, and I'll come back to, to the, this actually has three graph components as well. There, there are three, three separate components here. 
and um, we can uh, we can uh, we can um, run the test for uh, uh, spatial autocorrelation for lattice data, uh, originally written by uh, Moran, 1948-1950s, uh, 1950 were papers, and generalized by Cliff and Ord in 1969 and in their book in 1973, which is sort of more or less when, when I was coming into this. And we see that uh, if we're just looking at the y variable, which we've generated and we've seen in the variogram without taking account of the trend, is displaying strong spatial dependence. Moran's eye says this is very strongly dependent. The statistic, which is a, a z statistic, uh, is 4.44, uh, treating it as, as a, normally, uh, a standard normal uh, uh, deviate. Uh, then we can look up the, the p-value for this, and it's, it's highly significant. So it's very unlikely that these y-values would have occurred with this spatial patterning at random. Uh, however, if we fit a model which takes account of the distance from the western edge, the spatial autocorrelation is gone. Now, here, we've designed the setting such that we know that distance from the western edge is going to affect what happens. But we could see that the uh, distance from the west, if you didn't take into account inhomogeneity, distance from the western end was tricking the k-hat to thinking that the data were clustered when they weren't, was tricking the uh, variogram model to appear non-flat when it should have been flat had one taken account of the fact that there was a, mis uh, a missing background variable and the same with with Moran's eye. Moran's eye differs very slightly between the uh, between the setting for uh, uh, simply a variable, this is the variable here that we're looking at, or at the residuals of a regression. If we had modelled the regression here in exactly the same way, that we just said that the uh, just include the intercept as we did for the variogram model, then we would reproduce this value uh, when randomization is false. So, so we're in a situation where empirically we don't know that there's something missing, or that there's something uh, something odd in some other feature of the specification of our data set. We detect spatial autocorrelation, and we might rush off and try to interpret it. However, the spatial autocorrelation might just as easily have been, uh, or in fact, in the case of Moran's eye, it's exactly like uh, uh, Durbin's, the Durbin-Watson test for, 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 for time series. It will pick up other elements of misspecification which are leading to patterning occurring in the residuals. So the Moran's eye test is a, is a test for uh, patterning in the residuals, but the patterning doesn't necessarily have to have come from where we interpret it as having come from. Uh, so, no, there are there are a number of other 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 point, points points which could be which could be uh, which could be made here. There's a uh, an approach to uh, to spatial autocorrelation in the lattice sense, which attempts to uh, to um, express the autocorrelation locally, to say are there places on the map where there is more spatial autocorrelation, places on the map where there's less spatial autocorrelation. This is very prevalent in, in ArcGIS, where they call it hotspot analysis, used an awful lot. Um, the initial local Moran's eye was introduced uh, in, in 1995 6 by Luke Anselin. And I've sat in conference sessions with him where we've both sort of hidden our heads in our hands, seeing less than convincing interpretations of maps of local Moran's eye. Because just as global Moran's eye, Moran's eye for the whole data set, can um, 
reflect model misspecification, local Moranzai can reflect it in exactly the same way. So, some maps of local Moranzai, as if we don't take account of the trend, so we're seeing some z values which are really quite high. So that quite a lot of the map has contributions to global Moranzai which are not very large. But some of them are large and positive, and some of them are large and negative. So you've got one or two which are large and negative. If we accommodate the trend, but use uh, an approach to uh, fitting the uh, standard uh, normal deviate, from which inf inference was the z value. Use an, uh, an, uh, an, an analytical approach to doing this, then we get one result. If we use a settle point approximation, which is another technique, and which arguably is statistically better supported, uh, even better supported is an exact approach, so I have a paper with Werner Muller and, and uh, one of his students from 2009 with an exact approach. What you tend to find then is that the Z values get toned down so that very few of them would attract attention. However, in many of the hotspot identifying um, uh, programs, then neither saddle point approximation is used the exact approach uh, the exact approach is not used both of those involve both of those involve um, uh, numerical integration for each of the elements that you're looking at in addition for the for for, for these cases there's a multi multiple comparison problem the multiple comparison problem is that drawing if you're only testing for uh, local spatial autocorrelation in one of the observations you're okay. If you're testing in multiple observations, then actually you're using the results from one in another one. So you're using the data from one test in a, the test of the, its neighbors, so that the data is being re reused multiple times. Uh, and you'd need to make the same kinds of adjustment that you'd make in a meta-analysis, which is, is adjusting for multiple, multiple comparisons by adjusting the, the, the p-value. And very often you'll then find that, that, that none of the local spatial autocorrelations should be treated as being significant. So the hotspot analysis is, is something which is uh, in strong demand worldwide, but shouldn't be. Uh, another case, so I'm going to tire you out by showing you all of the pitfalls of spatial autocorrelation. So, uh, okay, okay. Uh, the the, the, the uh, North Carolina SIDS data set, I've mentioned it already, so just read it in. Um, uh, we, we've, we've now got the data on board, and uh, off we go. So this is this is this is the the, the data set, and what we have are the uh, the number of uh, live births per county in nineteen period nineteen seventy four nineteen seventy eight the number nineteen seventy nine uh, seventy four so, so it's five year period uh, to to eighty four to eighty three seventy nine eighty eighty one so eighty eighty three. Uh, the SIDS counts per county, so sudden infant death, which was a big conundrum for, 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 for the health service in, in many countries uh, at the time. And something which appeared possibly to be relevant, but turned out not to be relevant, which was the number of non-white births. Uh, this is obviously... It was observable because it was recorded in, in, in the birth registers, but uh, the um, uh, socioeconomic status of the families uh, concerned was not recorded. So that the, the probability is that this was a proxy for, 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 for socioeconomic status. And it's carefully described in, in articles by... The, the references to the articles are in, in the, this, this vignette. Um, 
Well, the references are to, to, to work by, by Cressy, uh, Noel Cressy and, and co-authors. And it's very carefully documented, in, in both in the articles and in Cressy's book, uh, Statistics for Spatial Data, from 1991. So it's a, it's a classic data set. But in addition to the, this, there were two further uh, variables which partitioned the area into a, a feasible grid of 16. So it was a four by four partition of the area. Um, only 12 of the uh, grid cells overlapped with any of the counties. So there are, there are 12 of these categories for, for chunking up the area. And in work that, 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 that Cressy did, he fitted, he fitted a, a, a regular, uh, a regular um, so he was modeling the continuous rate, uh, but a transformed rate. So he was using a, a Freeman Tukey transformation of the rate. Uh, at the point of time at which they were doing the work, so this is the, the, the mid to late 80s, uh, then how to do Poisson regression with, uh, with spatial dependence was not something which was, which was well studied. So one model was straight off, one model was, we've got these, um, we've got these, uh, so it's a, a model saying that the, the, the rate of uh, SIDS incidence is related to the rate of SIDS incidence in neighbouring counties. The next one was related to the rate of SIDS incidence in neighbouring counties. Oh, the, 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 there was an error term but there was only, in the first model, there was only an intercept. In the second model, there was which part of the state are we in? Are we in the far west of the state, the south of the state? That kind of thing. And then the third one was including uh, the, uh, the non-white births and uh, as a spatial error con component. Uh, variables are count data, uh, and the, there are grouping variables, the L and the M. And from the 1985 paper, they, the, the paper prints the, the, uh, the um, neighbor object, uh, the neighbor object, which can be read in as what, 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 what's termed a GAL file. A GAL file was Geographical Algorithms Library of the University of Newcastle from the 1980s, which defi defined, if, if you were going to store a text version of the graph of neighbors, then this would be, be how you would do it. Uh, so here we can plot the geometry in the background and then plot on top of that the, the, uh, the, um, the graph of neighbours, so which county was considered as being a neighbour of which county. And it would be those proximate neighbours which would be used in modelling the uh, residual spatial, uh, spatial autocorrelation. So here we're not going to be dealing with the data, we're just going to use the framework of, of the 100 counties and this graph of neighbours to show how uh, spurious spatial autocorrelation can, can, can come into being. So we're setting the seed, we're generating uh, um, uh, n 100 uh, random numbers. Uh, we are turning the neighbour object into a into a a, a spatial weights object, a list of weights object, LW. And so we're carrying out a Moran test on, on this data. And in this case, we're finding um, the, the, the way that Moran's I statistic is, is calculated is that there's, there's a basic, simply a calculation of, of the, of the um, product of the value at uh, I and J. So you're dealing with I and J, but going through the weights so that the product is included only if the uh, observations are neighbours. So if I and J are neighbours, then the product's included. If I and J are not neighbours, the product is not included. And then we're summing up uh, these. This then, in Moran's, Moran's eye, gets compared with uh, what would be the situation if so we're comparing it with the, with, this, with the variance of the variable as a whole. So we've got the spatial variance uh, on top and the variance of the variable uh, below. And then we 
depending on, on the values of the, of the spatial weights, uh, we can draw some conclusions based on this. We can see that in this case there is, there is uh, no spatial autocorrelation. This is the calculation. The expectation is, is uh, minus 1 divided by uh, 1 minus n. Um, so that's the ex expectation. And the variance can be calculated in a number of different ways. Anal analytical variance can be calculated in a number of different ways, but it can also be calculated using saddle point approximation or a, a, the exact, a, exact method. There are very little, very few differences for global Moran's eye between the analytical uh, variances and the saddle point, uh, saddle point approximation and the exact. Very small. So the, the, the analytical variances are fine. Um, uh, you're then looking at the value of the statistic minus the expectation divided by the square root of the variance. That gives you the standard deviate, and you can look it up in the table of the, of the normal distribution. So no spatial autocorrelation there. So if we introduce a, a, a trend, and here we'll look at a trend which is moving from the southwest towards the northeast, and here we're looking at uh, a, a trend variable like this, and here we've got the, the, the random variable. We could change the signal-to-noise ratio by, by increasing or decreasing sigma. And we've got alpha as 1 as a constant. And then we've got beta for the trend, for the spatial trend across the area. And we've got the, the, uh, the, the random, random variable, the one that we're interested in. OK, so ah. now we have dreadful spatial autocorrelation. So we've introduced dreadful spatial autocorrelation by introducing a trend, but forgetting that, that there's a trend present. If we model, once again, the trend, which is including the... the this, is, this, is what we're, this is our observed variable, but including the previously omitted um, covariate, we get back to where we were before. So... so this is the, 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 the key paper for this uh, is, is by Macmillan from 2003 in a relatively inaccessible regional science journal where he does exactly the same thing as this. He says that, that, that it's so easy, but here we know that we're introducing an unobserved covariate. So we can put it back and get back to, to sanity. But empirically, you don't know... <laughs> that you have model misspecification. And if you then go forward and try to interpret uh, measures of spatial autocorrelation as, as though spatial autocorrelation... He doesn't use the term reify spatial autocorrelation, so make it a thing. But that's the, that's the danger, that we attach too much importance to something which may simply be uh, an adaptation that we need pragmatically to make to account for the fact that our data collection was incomplete. Not in terms of the numbers of observations, but in terms of the depth of attributes that we managed to collect data about. So if you're working in epidemiology, very often you simply don't have uh, all of the data about the cases that you would have needed in order to, to conduct a, a, a well-specified model. You acknowledge that, and you add in a spatially, a spatially structured random effect to take account of that. The, the, there isn't really any other way of handling it because you can't go back to historical data or you can't go back to the field to collect data, say, on um, finding out whether the provision of uh, treated... So, The data are saying that bed nets were not used, but you don't you don't know why. Or maybe the field data uh, uh, collection failed to note something, so that you're seeing groups of households with very similar responses, and and you can't see why it is, and you can't go back to the field to find out why why this is the case. So that adding in Okay, there's something here which is spatial, but it's not a spatial story. It, the, 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 
this isn't isn't occurring because uh, these households and these households are close to one another. They're forming two different clusters with different responses. They're equal distance from water bodies. So why would we expect that the, that this one is affected more by mosquitoes than this one? And maybe there was something in the treatment of the bed nets, or maybe the bed nets weren't delivered to some households or were delivered to others. We don't know. Something has happened. Spatially structured random effect that dampens the effects of something which was going on in the data over which we no longer have, have, have control. You could say, okay, if, if we suspect that there's something wrong with the data collection, we could drop those observations. That's another, another possibility. But epidemiologists are very often confronted with the need to model data in situations where the data to hand are not ideal. Uh, ecologists are very often much better placed uh, simply because they have much better control of their data collection unless you get equipment failure. So if you're getting equipment failure, then, then again, you've, you've got some of the data, but not all of it. Okay. So we can manipulate missing variable misspecification to look like spatial autocorrelation. Uh, one of the very few references, apart from my references to uh, uh, Dan McMillan's 2003 paper is in uh, Schabenberger and Gottway's textbook on spatial statistics, uh, where they say that uh, Dan McMillan may be the only person who's ever understood spatial autocorrelation properly in, in, in relation to Moran's eye. I, I think maybe that's a, a little severe, and certainly I get on very well, <laughs> well with, with, with Carol Gottway, but, but okay. I think it's a fair point that, the, that in some disciplines, spatial autocorrelation is seen as a, a really big deal and something which explains what's going on. And what Macmillan was pointing to is that, so wait a moment, don't jump to conclusions. Maybe what you're looking at is model specification, model misspecification, and you probably need to check that out first. It does dampen the success of grant applications. If you can say, I'm going to use machine learning with data science with, with uh, spatial autocorrelation and we'll solve all of the world's problems, you're much more likely to be successful than saying uh, our project will involve uh, severe or challenging conceptual problems because we'll be trying to use uh, larger data sets in situations where the data are noisy, the signal is weak, and the data collection is shot. And we have no con uh, yeah, volunteer data. So that grant application, if it was sent to me as a reviewer, great, this is the one that I give five stars. These are people who are sane, they're sober, they know how the world works, uh, but I get lots more which are, which, are, which are doing their pitch and saying how, how successful <laughs> their analysis will be because they need the cash. Um, and like, you can understand that too. And it sometimes feels a little unfair to write a, 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 a less than stellar review of, uh, of a project proposal which is, is over the top. It feels a little unfair, but, but, but it, it isn't okay to, to, to sort of jump in and say that, that um, ranges of, of uh, relevant or topical um, social and political problems can be resolved by paying attention to spatial autocorrelation. Uh, you need to pay attention to data collection first, and one of the aspects m may include spatial autocorrelation. Um, you know, then also dealing with a whole range of other things about politicians never wanting to hear about uncertainty, or, or even grant givers. So it's quite difficult to get a project funded where the topic you're attempting to analyze is uncertainty. Uh, that that it, it is not so easy. Okay, so the, the, the next exercise here was simply to, to, to uh, aggregate uh, 
the data to the 12 chunks. So we've now got 12 chunks. We generate a, a list of neighbors for these, or a neighbor object, um, and uh, again, randomize across this. And here were uh, um, uh, for the, for the random variable with with nothing going on, everything is fine. Uh, but if we if we um, uh, as here we've got lm lm rand with plotting lm rand, and we've got this. So so sorry, I'll I'll in, uh, as I was talking about something else. Uh, the the point here is. We've already dealt with the fact that model misspecification may look like spatial autocorrelation. But quite often, we only have observations at an aggregate level. And we then copy them out to the entities which belong to that aggregate. Does that make sense? So let's say that we have observations for uh, census districts Grunkretze in, in, in Norwegian census terminology. And we've got, we've, we've got quite a lot of data there. But in some cases, we've only got data for uh, school districts, which are aggregates of the uh, Grunkretze. So let's say we may have 10 Grunkretze in a school district. And what we're interested in doing is seeing uh, some relationship between the population data and the school data. I'm not talking about PISA, as they don't go down to school level. But say, say we've got something about the schools and we've got the census data, maybe we're in interest. It could be school performance related to socioeconomic background, all kinds of things. But we've got two observations of variables at two different levels. Now, what happens if we have an uncorrelated, unspatially correlated upper level, but we copy out the values to the lower level, which is where we have much more information? So that, that's what we're doing here. So we're aggregating the, the 12 blocks of counties. We're generating a random variable at the level of those blocks, the 12 blocks. And within those 12 blocks, there are no uh, there's there's no spatial autocorrelation in the blocks, and the, the this is then the map of uh, of the values in the blocks. So there's no spatial autocorrelation in, in in these. However, if we then copy out these values to the hundred counties, all of the counties in each block are going to have identical values. Yep. So as you can see here, so that in this block everybody is at the top end. In this block, everybody is at the top end. So that there will be very strong spatial autocorrelation intra-block and possibly very weak spatial autocorrelation interblock. And we've done this ourselves. So we've injected very strong spatial autocorrelation into this covariate. So if we look at the spatial autocorrelation at the level of the counties, the 100 counties, not the 12 blocks, it's, it's, so we rush off and do a big story about, <laughs> about spatial autocorrelation. But this, this problem of having data at different levels of aggregation is, is pervasive. There's a lot of, uh, there are many situations where you meet this, meet, meet this problem. And it then means that in the uh, final analysis, you have a choice between uh, uh, um, using the finest possible aggregation, where you actually have a lot of data. You've got data, uh, interesting, useful data, on households uh, in, in, in this aggregation. But you've also introduced spatial autocorrelation, which is going to hang around in the residuals. So have you actually got spatial autocorrelation or not? How can you handle, and this then becomes the, the motivation for looking at multi-level uh, approaches, even though in, in fact the, it, it, 
uh, we'll, we'll get to it tomorrow. But, but even when you try to do it by the book, it, it still turns out to be quite difficult when you're doing this copying out of values. You could do it the other way, which for the Boston data set I did in a paper from 2017, and I'll try and remember tomorrow to give you the reference for it, where I aggregate everything up to the blocks from um, 500, 490 lower level to 90 something at the upper level. But then you're losing information, which may be the variability within those blocks is also interesting. And that maybe it's not a good idea to, to aggregate things up. In that case, I think aggregating them up makes, makes better sense. But uh, anyway, so th that, that's the, the, the conceptual background. And now one or two, uh, one or two points with regard to, uh, with regard to, how, how, to how to actually uh, conduct these tests. We're dealing here with, in, in, with a case with, with aerial support use the, the, the Polish presidential election data set that I brought in for visualization um, last time. Um, and uh, we're, um, we're also using the, the, the uh, buffer by zero trick to, uh, to remove uh, invalidity for plotting of, of the, 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 the data. Uh, this is the, the, the data set. It actually includes um, 70, 80 variables because they're the records from the first round. Um, the, 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 the boundary data are for uh, Polish local authorities and uh, the um, um, urban districts within Warsaw. But they're aggregated from from the raw data uh, CSV file for the uh, for all of the uh, all of the um, counting stations, so that, that uh, in each municipality and municipalities with small population, there may be seven, eight, nine polling stations. In in cities, there will be hundreds of polling stations. So it's a, it's a big file. So you aggregate that up, but you've got things like the uh, the 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 the, the um, registered population, uh, the number of people who turned up at the polling station, of the people who turned up at the polling station, the number of people who took a voting card, the people who took the voting card, how many of them completed it correctly and how many didn't. In local elections immediately prior to this, uh, the number of spoiled ballots in some areas was as high as 20%. Uh, because the authorities had changed the rules, and if you crossed off more than one candidate at all, the ballot became unpopular, it became invalid. Uh, and previously, you'd been able to choose from one party and then somebody else from another party in the Norwegian context, then you might call it a schlenger. So that, that you're, you're voting for, you're saying, generally, I want to vote for the first candidate for this party but I also like this candidate who's in a different party. And that previously that had been okay. And, and uh, uh, in, in 2014, uh, it, it uh, ceased to be. So that in some places there was, there was a very high level of, of invalid ballots. So there's all of that data. There's the whole accounting data set for, for, the, for, for, for the presidential election in 2015. Uh, and there's data, data, information about where the data came from in, 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 on the help page for, the, for, for, for this. Uh, we can generate the, um, the uh, contiguous proximate neighbors using the poly to NB function in SPDIP. Uh, we're choosing to use queen neighbors, which in this case is, it, it, there wouldn't be much difference from rook neighbors between rook neighbors and queen neighbors. Uh, rook neighbors are when uh, entities share a border, share a boundary. A queen neighbor is when they share at least one point on the boundary. But for a rook neighbor, you have to share more than one point on the boundary. Um, poly to NB is uh, forgiving. Uh, 
because it uh, it permits you to uh, snap boundary points. In this case, we've already run through the cleaning of the geometries, um, so that snap's not being used. And as you can see here, although the SPDEP package predates even predates even uh, uh, SP, uh, it can use uh, SP classes for the data containers or it can use SF classes for the data containers since uh, uh, March this year, February, March this year. So it's, it's accommodated SF classes. So this is, this is an SF object and it, it's handled in exactly the same way as, as one would handle a, an SP object. Yeah. I get to that. So the question was, can you turn it into an eye graph? And yes, you can. It's not one step, it's uh, one, two, three. But yes, and eye graphs are for representing uh, graph structures. Um, so um, here we, we print the qualities of this. There are 2,495 2, objects. Uh, it took uh, about two seconds to, to create. Uh, the the num number of non-zero links is 14,000. The average number of links is about six, which is very typical for, for uh, polygons, with the exception of Central Park. Central Park is worldwide perhaps one of the, the only polygons which has um, 30 neighbors. And Central Park, the, the census, census district track block, block group for Central Park has 30 neighbors. And that's because there are lots of streets which touch Central Park and Central Park has very few inhabitants. So obviously Central Park is, is, is an entity by itself and it has very many neighbors, but this is very un uncommon. Uh, we can, if, if we plot the geometry of the SF object, we can, if we just plot the geometry, uh, the SF plot plot method does not mess with the layout of the uh, of the graphics device, and so we can overplot with the uh, with the uh, um, uh, with the uh, with the with the graph the network of, of of neighbors. Here, I've also created an object called Quads, which I'd better perhaps explain, or didn't I show? I haven't shown that. No, here. What I've said is that I'm taking the centroids of the geometries of the local authorities and choosing the of largest polygon is true. There are one or two of the local authorities which are composed of more than one uh, polygon, and in which case it takes the centroid of uh, it takes the centroid of uh, the largest component polygon, and that's then putting a point onto that centroid of the polygons and then drawing the graph uh, between uh, the representing the, 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 the neighbors. Uh, we could also, uh, using SF, uh, reduce the, uh, slightly, uh, reduce the search which takes place in poly to NB to find candidate neighbors. Poly to NB also tries to find candidate neighbors, but it does it uh, in a, an ad hoc way, which was written almost 20 years ago. And we can use the, the um, uh, topologic, uh, to topological predicates from uh, S, uh, SF to generate the same thing. And what we're doing is seeing whether the bounding boxes of the polygons overlap. If the bounding boxes of the polygons intersect one with another, then it's very likely that they may be neighbors. If they don't overlap, if the bounding boxes of two polygons don't overlap, there's no point testing them to see whether they're neighbors because they're not going to be neighbors. Uh, so that, uh, so that uh, we've got their found in box is an extra argument to poly to NB. And um, th so this is, this is slightly messy, but, but it's uh, emulating uh, an, uh, something which we developed for the BARD uh, uh, political redistricting uh, problem for finding the neighbors of 90,000 uh, census districts in Los Angeles in 2010-11. Uh, 
so that you can save a little time by doing this. The data set here is quite small. It's in about 3,000 polygons, so it, it, it goes pretty fast anyway. Uh, and the, the two, are, two are similar. We, we know that there's only one graph component. In this case, we can check that by looking at the number of components in the graph. And we turn, turn this into a, a, a spatial weights object, a list W spatial weights object. But here we can choose a style. The style here says that the weight for each link on the graph is equal to 1. We could choose that to be equal to 1 divided by n. So over the whole, we could choose the, the sum of the, all of the weights to sum to 1. We could also row standardize, which is the typically, uh, typical approach in, in, uh, in uh, uh, the uh, social sciences. But here we'll, we'll work with, with, with the B style, binary style. You're either a neighbor or not a neighbor. If you're a neighbor, then the, uh, the neighbor weight is 1 for each neighbor which means that entities which have many neighbors, are the, the, the neighbor weights accumulate to more. If, on the other hand, you use what, what's known as row standardization, that is the weights for each entity sum to one, then the weights for the neighbors of entities which have very few neighbors are larger. So that the binary style places more weight in the analysis on entities with many neighbors and in the row standardized style you go the other way there's also a variant stabilizing style which tries to meet, get the two to so the negative aspects of both of them should be reduced but almost nobody uses it, it it's it's available but, but but very few people use it okay the first step towards getting to a graph is to make it into a list of weights. Then we can co coerce the list of weights into a sparse matrix. So once we've got a sparse matrix, uh, we can see here that this is symmetric. Uh, we could have checked the symmetry in, in other ways as well. And we can see what the, uh, what the sparse matrix looks like. So that you, you don't see very much going on here. Uh, you can see the 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 near to diagonal uh, values. Uh, uh, by definition, I is not a neighbor of I. So I cannot be a neighbor of I. So these are dots which are close to the diagonal, but which are not on, on the diagonal. What we could do, however, is to start powering up the matrix. Because the, uh, maybe it's in, in, the, in, the, in, in, the, in the text. It's not in the text. So a very sim simple step uh, is so saying powering up the space sparse matrix fills, fills in the higher order neighbors, so that if you power up the matrix, then I becomes a neighbor of K, where K was a neighbor of J in the first order, so the second order, so that I becomes a neighbor of K, second order, and third order, and so on, so if you power it up. But the, the, the where we get to uh, tomorrow is is for row standardized uh, for row standardized this is the spatial regression coefficient this is part of the operator in the car setting this is the operator in the sar setting which i come to tomorrow uh, it's this times its transpose which is which is the operator but it can also be expressed as a power sum to infinity of rho i w i. So that the spatial, under certain conditions, you can express the spatial process as a power sum, including the power sum of the w's. Uh, so you'll see, sometimes you'll see arguments that, well, everything could be related to everything else, so that in order to include everything, we should, for instance, make everything a neighbor of everything else, but use distance, inverse distance weights to say that the places which are further apart are uh, their neighbors, but they're not as strong neighbors as the others. You get actually the same thing, uh, which I get to in a moment, by using the, 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 the a regular, 
sparse matrix, just a sparse matrix, given the maths behind the model, it, it, it's using all of the relationships across the whole graph. Because you look at a, a list of neighbors and you say, well, what is, I is only a neighbor of, of J. And that's, that's not telling us enough. But actually, I is a neighbor of all of these. I is a neighbor of all uh, 2,494 other observations linked through the graph and steps across the graph. So here we've got the, this is the, the square. If we multiply it up again, it's getting a bit denser. And you can see here that, in fact, the data in Poland are organized by province. The, 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 the way that they're, they're listed is by province. So that we've got here one province, two, uh, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Uh, I was hoping I'd, uh, you'd be able to see sixteen. There are sixteen provinces, uh, and that, that 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 that's what's going on there. This one is actually is one province divided into two bits, isn't it? Uh, there's an SP vignette which uh, uh, looks at the description of the relationship to to I graph, and so. Once we've got a sparse matrix, this is a, a symmetric sparse matrix, uh, then in the iGraph uh, package, then you've got graph adjacency. So we're saying, okay, here we've got a sparse matrix, and we specify that the graph is undirected. We saw before that the matrix was symmetric. This is undirected graph. Yep. So we could, we can get back the... <laughs> The, the, the adjacency matrix out of this by converting it back again to the same neighbors. So that you can go through a sparse matrix, so you go to the list of weights, the neighbors, the list of weights for whichever style of weights you want, then to a sparse matrix, then to a graph, then back from the graph to a sparse matrix to a list of weights and the neighbors. So there are four steps, but it's, it's okay. There's a single graph component. So we can use the, the, the functionality in iGraph to do the same kinds of things that Nicholas Lowenkoch implemented for SPDEP uh, 20 years ago. But it, I mean, it, 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 his, his implementation was done uh, not in a general way, so that we were simply interested in, in particular features. At that stage, he was working in, in, in uh, uh, ecology, uh, but then went into, into pharmaceutical, into the, as a statistician, but working first on ecological data, then, then, which led to this interest. And, and uh, as the graph is connected, we can find the diameter of the graph, 52. That's the, the, the shortest path across the whole graph. So it's the diameter of the graph. Uh, we can also ask what the maximum shortest path is. This is in a matrix of shortest paths. If we look at the matrix, we can say how many steps you're taking to move across the graph. Uh, I've mentioned spatially structured uh, random effects and the way in which they're handled in uh, many other packages, including uh, HGLM, CarBayes, uh, MGCV, uh, BayesX, InLab, you name it. So the, there are interfaces between the representation of neighbors in SPDEP and all of these. And the, these, are, these are some examples. So that if we take the neighbor object uh, and use uh, NB to GRA, which is in R base X, then you get a graph object. The graph object uh, is for a particular style of uh, Markov random field. Uh, for Inla, then we would write it out to a temporary file, which for, for the uh, um, BYM or uh, car proper, car, I car models is so that, so that, um, um, the uh, 
the representations which are which which are used by other packages are supported from either by them themselves or by by uh, SPDEP. The same thing applies with the ADE Habitat pack packages, the family of packages ADE Habitat, uh, where again there are relationships between the way they have neighbor, handle neighbors and the way SPDEP handles neighbors that you can move the the neighbor objects backwards and forwards it's, it's not a it's not 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 a particular challenge uh, what does it mean when a neighbor object is not symmetric typically if we used the the coordinates rather than the polygons in this case we could say well we want to find the five nearest neighbors only Exceptionally, would you find a polygon data set where the boundary contiguities match the five nearest neighbors? It would be very unusual. Uh, it's very usual with k nearest neighbors for one set to be overlap with the neighbor set of a neighbor, but it won't be complete. So that the, 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 uh, the, the fact that i is a neighbor of j and j means that J is a neighbor of I, the symmetry uh, um, condition, will in general not be met with K nearest neighbors. And in this case, it isn't. Uh, in this case, we're, we're using the NC, North Carolina data set 100, the 500 of them. And we get a note on the, the, printed, uh, the print method of the object telling us, sorry, and non-symmetric neighbors. Um, as if we then convert to a list of neighbors, sparse matrix, and then compare uh, uh, the k nearest neighbors W with its transpose, it's it's not equal. So it's so it's it, it's 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 false. If we look at an image of it, then it might look a bit symmetric, but it's not completely. So that in many cases. I is a neighbor of J and J is a neighbor of I because they're quite close to each other. But in some situations, the fifth nearest neighbor will not be the one who is proximate. It will be another one. Uh, this then means in relation to the I graph uh, uh, connection that non-symmetric neighbors are giving directed graphs rather than undirected graphs, which is going to give us a, so some other pictures. So if we then ask, if we take the shortest paths and we then make a map of the shortest paths across, uh, across, across North Carolina, then we see something, some, some, something like this, where uh, starting from the one, uh, the one which is furthest, I think we started from the one which was furthest east. Yep. So we're, we're start, starting from here and then you're stepping out across the graph to get to, to the one here, which was the, 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 the diameter of the graph was 20. So that to get from, from the, the Atlantic coast to, to, to into the Appalachians, then you, you've got 20 steps on the graph. But we could also look at the distance um, And here we've got the distance in kilometers plotted against the shortest path count. Now that <laughs> was uh, in, in Toulouse, I, I sort of teased people, I said, discuss, sit, sit, and talk, sit, sit next to your neighbor and discuss. And, and people said, oh, what's this about? What this is about is, is about this. It's about this. So that here we're looking at steps across a graph and actually steps across a graph in most cases replicate the distance relationship so that if you use inverse distance weighting your um, uh, in Norwegian you'd say smør på flesk in Polish you'd say masło maślane in, in different languages so that you're you're over over yoking it in English, so you don't need to use distance graph. The number of steps across the graph is replicating what you're getting from the distance, and you're avoiding having a dense matrix. Uh, 
you don't need the dense matrix. The dense matrix is actually not your friend. And it's not your friend pragmatically because it makes calculation more difficult with large numbers of observations because you're dealing with a, a, a dense n by n matrix, which you don't want to have to deal with. But a graph-based measure of, of, of point support data, graph-based measure, even k nearest neighbors, is doing very well, small k. It's doing very well. And it's giving you largely the same result as saying, well, we're ecologists, so we have to use inverse distance weights. You don't. Convincing reviewers that you don't is your problem. And reviewers will typically say, well, we, in, in our field of study, we only ever use inverse distance weighting. Yep, okay. okay. But the... the the, the the graphs the graphs are fairly clear. The, the, there's a certain amount of variability around that line, but but it, I don't think I'd lose an awful lot of sleep uh, about that. We can make uh, objects from uh, the imported neighbors for for base X, which I've shown you um, uh, for for, for Inla, and 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 so on. Um, now. At this point, I'm starting to get in get into modeling, and uh, I'm not sure that I wouldn't uh, prefer to stop there and start tomorrow uh, after that point. So I've spent a, about an hour uh, discussing. Uh, some of the conceptual background for spatial autocorrelation. I've then gone through some of the aspects of uh, neighbor and weights objects, and also shown that going for sparse objects is almost always a sensible idea, also conceptually, and uh, not just uh, not just outside that. Uh, does that make sense? So that then, because I'm, I'm now starting to move in, move into modeling the, the the North Carolina data set, so that that I can start from that point tomorrow morning, and then I've put up uh, more slides for tomorrow uh, already for tomorrow morning, and the slides for tomorrow afternoon will go up uh, before very long. That's the multi level. There's there's probably too much information in 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 those as as well. So what I've been trying to communicate is that um, is that uh, it's your choice. Uh, if you feel that in your in your area of study you will benefit from boosting spatial autocorrelation, feel free to do that. But be a little careful because you may get me as a reviewer. So so and and I as, as I remember a conversation with. With uh, with Jim Lesage, who, who it's after I'd given a, 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 my bit of a workshop, we were doing R and MATLAB spatial in in Toulouse, and and I'd done an example uh, based on a very nice paper, part, co-authored by by Bill Venables, in which he'd presented at the USA uh, or the, the 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 distributed statistical computing meeting in Vienna in two thousand three where he'd shown that f this was uh, sp spatiotemporal fisheries data where the uh, where the um, the problem that he as an applied statistician was facing was that uh, for two different varieties of shrimp being harvested off the northwestern coast of Australia uh, changes had been being seen in one of the varieties the t t t t t tiger shrimps and the data were from the vessels, which then had a position as of where they were in geographical coordinates. And they also had when the, the, the reports were made. He simplified the data to say, well, okay, so what I'm actually interested in is how far the vessels are from the coast, 
and then how far they are along the coast from the westernmost point for this observation set. So he reduced the geographical position to two variables, which were then included in the, in, in, in the generalized linear model. So one was, how far are we along the coast from the, from, from the west? And the other one was, how far out to sea are we? He then had variables such as uh, the uh, sea depth, and the crucial variable was, uh, was so the, the, the yield, but he had the bottom conditions. And what had actually been happening was that, uh, was that uh, boats which were fishing for one of the varieties of shrimps were using heavy bottom trawls and were destroying the habitat of the other shrimp. So the, the policy problem was that the actual explanatory variable which mattered was not space, it was where, uh, where is the gear being used destroying the habitat of the other uh, variety. And it, it was is well argued and it works and he got a model which uh, explained uh, the collapse in one of the, the fisheries with regard to, also with regard to, to, to the other. So that one of the fisheries was doing okay Another, which had a more valuable, uh, more valuable product, was not doing okay and had been seeing, seeing declining, uh, declining, uh, declining yields. And the the model simply works that if you if you had the the gear included, then you, then you were you were you were you were getting there. The model was working really well. And and so I said, what well, maybe this is a, a useful take home lesson for people doing work with spatial data is that there doesn't have to be a spatial story to getting a, a good model fit. So what you want is actually to engage with the variables you're dealing with and maybe whether there is or isn't spatial autocorrelation is completely, uh, is completely orthogonal to your real concerns. Maybe it isn't. But maybe it is, and in, in the case for, 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 for the, the Venables and co-author paper, it was quite clear that they reached uh, a, a actionable conclusions, which was uh, that the fishery, fisheries uh, authorities could uh, take steps to re restrict the use of the gear which was destroying the habitat for the more valuable fishery. Uh, and and um, uh, Jim said to me over a I mean, it was Toulouse, it was a nice lunch. He says, you're digging the ground from under your own feet. So are you engaged with spatial autocorrelation? If you are, then you shouldn't, you shouldn't disavow it. <laughs> I said, I'm not disavowing it, but I'm saying that data analysts have data to analyze, and, and that's probably more important than finding a spatial story where maybe a recasting of the problem leads one not to find a further spatial story. Maybe, maybe this isn't the problem. But um, jokingly, he sort of said, well, yeah, but we're all sitting on this branch and you're um, vigorously <laughs> cutting the branch and you're sitting on the bit which is outside where you're cutting. You should be sitting on the other side of your saw. I said, I don't think I managed to saw through this branch very quickly. I don't, I don't think we can influence people. So if you look at the use of, of uh, hotspots in ArcGIS, there are, there are tens of thousands of people using, using this stuff regularly. And y y you can try to communicate to them that maybe, it, maybe it's not a brilliant idea. Maybe you need to look at uh, omitted variables or look at uh, different functional relationships. But it's not going to get there because it doesn't give a tidy. It's, it's really nice to be able to say to the, uh, the committee of your city who is worried about crime is that we've got a hotspot here, so that they can commit their resources to the hotspot which has been found by the algorithm. Uh, when in fact, the place where the payoff from allocation of police resources might be somewhere completely different. But they could say, we've got an algorithm, we've got a result, we've got a map, we put the police there, and this is going to be great. And by the time they find out that crime has been increasing somewhere else, they're no longer on the council, so it doesn't matter. Uh, think Boris Johnson. Sorry, that's a political point. So I better turn off the streaming. <laughs>